from Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will return them to their home, declares the Lord. These are the words of our Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. You guys doing well? Outstanding. Good to have you with us. Welcome to the Desert Breeze Community Church. Also want to welcome those of you that are on YouTube live right now. Thank you for joining us. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hosea chapter 11. We're looking at verses 1 to 11. This is our Hosea teaching series, God's Persistent Love. God's Persistent Love. This is a very powerful text, as you could probably tell through the reading, and I think it will have a a great impact on your life this morning. We're going to talk about God's deep affection for you. God's deep affection for you. In this text, Hosea switches metaphors on us from from faithful husband and adulterous wife. That's been pretty much throughout the book of Hosea. He switches metaphors from that to a devoted father and a wayward son. When you read through the New Testament, you you see that Jesus consistently referred to God as Father, and he taught his disciples to to interact with God, to have relationship with God by referring to Him as Abba, Father, Abba, Daddy, Father. Here's a familiar Desert Breeze statement that I never get tired of saying. If you only knew the Father heart of God for you, it would change everything. If you only knew what he thinks about you, how he feels about you, what he wants to do in and through your life, (laughs) nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing would keep you from him. You would run to him every day. I love what Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 7, 7 through 11. He's talking about asking, seeking, knocking, interacting with with the Father. And he says this to them. He says, if you, though you are evil, oh, you, you know you're evil. If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven love to give good things to those who ask him? Your Father in heaven has a deep affection for you. And I'm telling you, when you begin to understand that, not just as an idea in your head, but, but a felt experience in your heart, I'm telling you, it will change everything about you and about your life. In fact, you can see there part of, part of the notes here, no parent on earth, I'm a parent and I'm a grandparent, and this is a very true statement, no parent on earth wants the very best for their 
child or grandchild as much as your Father in heaven wants for you. So in this text, this is what we see. We're going to look at the Father's loving heart, the Father's broken heart, the Father's gracious heart, and then the Father's redeeming heart. But before we do that, let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just take a moment once again. God, we are delighted to be here today. We absolutely love your presence. We love growing in our relationship with you. We want to know you more and more. And we pray through the study of your word, the work of your Holy Spirit, that your deep affection for us would not just be an idea in our mind, but a felt experience in our hearts, chasing away all of our fears freeing us from guilt and shame, healing our wounded souls, satisfying our deepest longings, and transforming every part of our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name, and everyone said, amen. So take a look at this first one on your notes. Keep your Bibles open. I'll be referring to the text. The Father's loving heart. This is based on verses 1 through 4. And here's your first three fill-in-the-blanks. He invites us to a life that is freeing, fulfilling, and fruitful. So anytime you are talking to your family or friends about the gospel, about coming to Christ, this is what you're inviting them to. You're inviting them to a a life that is freeing and fulfilling and fruitful more than anything that they could ever personally experience. Look at verse 1. He helps us to understand that. When Israel was a child... I loved him. This is where he's changing the metaphor here. I loved him, and out of Egypt, remember Egypt, the whole book of Exodus, Moses leading the the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage through the wilderness, headed towards the promised land. So out of Egypt, I called my son. That's where I get that freeing. He wants to free us. We can find fulfillment in him and fruitfulness, unlike we could ever find anyplace else. That's the invitation. That's the loving heart of God for us. Here's the next one. Our wrong concept of God keeps us from living in the reality of His love for us. So it's one thing to know in your head God loves you. It's altogether another thing to have that feeling in your heart, a felt experience in your heart. So what is it that keeps it from going from our head down into our heart? There's three things here I've got on your notes. Uh, Let me read verse 2, first of all, where I get this idea. Our concept of God keeps us from living in the reality of His love for us. Verse 2, the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. They continued with their idolatry. So here's three things that would block us from really experiencing His love in our heart. could be past injury. I've got these already filled in for you. I just wanted you to reflect on this and maybe identify one or two of these that are maybe keeping you from experiencing His love for you. Past injury. Past injury can come from uh, your experience of your earthly father. Your experience of your earthly father can either be positive or negative, shaping your understanding of God as Father. <clears throat> so just think for a moment. Was your experience with your earthly father primarily positive or primarily negative? Or where was it somewhere on that spectrum? It has an impact on how you relate now to your heavenly father. Now, if it was primarily or it leans more towards being negative that can create within you some bitterness that comes from unforgiveness, and it becomes a foothold for the enemy. I gave you the verses there. Hebrews 12, 13 talks about a bitter root growing up and causing trouble and defiling many, and we're missing the grace of God through that is what he says. Uh, Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, it says, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. So we're wounded we become angry, defense mechanism, we become bitter, that's unforgiveness, and over time it uh, skews our ability to relate to our heavenly Father. And so God wants to heal your heart this morning. He wants to start the process this morning. I can't help but think that there are those here that 
one of the reasons why you have a hard time connecting with your heavenly Father is because you had a really a messed up relationship horizontally. And I, I know that God can heal you of this. He can. He will set you free. But what it does is you come to him, he will give you a whole new definition of fatherhood, and he will forgive you of your sins, and as you receive forgiveness from him, you're able to offer it to your earthly father, and that will begin to set you free, and, and that's part of that, so that you can begin to experience more of the father heart of God. If you only knew the father heart of God for you, it would change everything. So past injury. Here's the next one would be unbelief. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Remember with Adam and Eve, the serpent tried to uh, get them to question, first of all, God's commandments. Did God really say that? I don't think he said that. Get them to question God's commandments. By the way, God's commandments for us are for our good. It's to protect us from the worst and to provide the very best for us. It's from his perfect love and infinite wisdom, and, and so the serpent got them to question God's commandments, and as he began to work on questioning God's commandments, then he began to work on them in questioning God's character. Here's what the enemy is up to. If he can't get you to doubt God's existence, he'll get you to doubt God's goodness, that he's holding out on you. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. And what happens is then you're going to begin to chase the things of this world more than you're going to pursue Him. And so it could be past injury. It could be unbelief. You, you just don't think that He has your best interest at heart. Nothing could be further from the truth, I'm telling you. No one loves you like your Father in heaven. Absolutely no one. And so when you begin to understand that and, and realize that, oh my goodness, Nothing will keep you from him. The next one would be pace of life. And I've got the story here in Luke 10, 38 through 42. It's the story of Mary and Martha. And, and Jesus could say to our generation what he said to Martha. Remember what he said to Martha? Martha, Martha, very tender words. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. What was the one thing that was necessary? It was sitting at the feet of Jesus connecting him. Let me, let me just say that to you. One thing, number one priority every day for you is to sit at the feet of Jesus, is to, is to look at him, engage him, encounter him, enjoy him, and then the rest of the day you can begin to practice his presence more than ever before. But your number one priority every day, you can't give what you don't have, and so if you're learning to cultivate this intimacy with him, do you take out time in solitude and silence and just reflecting deeply and engaging him and encountering him and enjoying him and experiencing him? Most important thing you could do every day. And that will transform your life more than anything. To gaze into the eyes of the one who adores you and loves you, gave his life for you, nothing will transform you more. And so we get so busy with our life, so many things happening in our life. Hurry and loving relationships with God and others is incompatible. The essence of hurry is too much to do and too many distractions. We have a lot of distractions in our lives. The primary one would be the digital distraction in our life. And so all my worst moments, all your worst moments or when we're in a hurry. Love, joy, and peace are incompatible with hurry. And I want you to know this, that when you sit and encounter God and read His Word and pray and pour your heart out to Him, and you begin to feel His deep affection for you, man, your heart will be filled up with love and joy and peace, a love, joy, and peace that this world can never give to you. That's what He offers us. If you're too busy to spend time with God, then you're too busy. You're too busy for the fullness of life that only He can give you. You're too busy for the love, joy, and peace that only He can give you. And it's not a matter of a disordered schedule. 
It's a matter of a disordered heart. Because if you only knew the Father heart of God for you, if you only knew what he thinks about you, how he feels about you, what he wants to do in and through your life, nothing would keep you from him. This is the best part of my day. Every morning when I spend time with him, oh my goodness, I I would have not survived ministry if I hadn't done that early on and developed that discipline. We'll talk about spiritual disciplines in a little bit, but that's such such a high priority. That's the most important thing that you can do every day, every day. We teach this in our DB life, really important. Here's the next thing. He begins to help us to understand this picture in our relationship with the Father. He is like a father coaxing and celebrating our first steps and comforting when we fall. Coaxing means consistent, gentle persuasion. This is God's deep affection for you. Look at verse 3. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. It's, it's like parents and watching their, their, their young child learning to walk, take their first steps. I find it so interesting. I was the same way, but I, I see young parents and they're going, look, they're learning to walk. No, they're learning to fall forward. That's what they're doing. They're not walking. They're just kind of stumbling forward and you swoop them up into your arms and love on them. That's a little bit of the picture here. And um, having children and ga- grandchildren I begin, it begin, to, begin to realize, and it was revolutionary for me, that God delights in me more than I delight in my kids and grandkids. I mean, I delight in my kids and grandkids like crazy. And when it began to dawn on me that even more so does, does God delight in me, it just, it, oh my goodness, it, it began to transform me. We have, uh, at the Davis home, we have a hammock uh, connected to some very large trees in our side yard. And when, that, when our grandkids are starting to get bigger now, but when they were smaller, they'd get in the hammock with grandpa, and I would hang my feet over the side of the hammock, and they would come up, and about two or three of them cling to me, and I would swing the hammock back and forth, almost up, way up on the side. And the kids would cling to me, and they would want me to really push it hard. They would love it. Go more, 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 grandpa. And then I would do it so much that they'd almost be falling, and they'd be clinging to me. And, and then they'd say, stop, 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 grandpa, stop. So I'd stop, put the brakes on, stop. And then I remember one of them saying, that scale we grandpa, do it again. <laughs> and so I'd do it again. And I'd just swing really hard, almost almost sling them out. We'd just like, whoo, whoo. <laughs> And they cling to me, and I'd stop. They'd go, that scale we guap off. Do it again. <laughs> My wife and I were headed up to Chino Valley a number of years ago. We had six or six grandkids in our Ford Flex, and we were heading up through uh, Black Canyon City and going up to Sunset Point, and you know how the traffic always kind of gets bogged down there and start coming to a stop. We were in the slow lane, and all of a sudden the faster lane opened up for us, and so I gunned it. I accelerated pretty aggressively, swung over into the lane, and started heading up the road pretty fast, and I heard a little voice in the back seat say to me, don't be driving crazy now, Grandpa. And I I just ignored it. (laughs) And then a few moments later, I heard from the back seat, what's the speed limit anyway, Grandpa? (laughs) And I I didn't say this, but I was thinking, none of your business, you little back seat driver. (laughs) So I delight in my grandkids except for when they get bossy like their grandma, okay? Oh, gosh, I didn't have to say that, but, but I love my grandkids. I love my kids. I delight in them. Intimacy with God is finding our deepest pleasure in God and feeling His deepest pleasure in us, feeling His deepest pleasure in us in us, living with the assurance that God loves us, adores us, and enjoys us, listen to me, will heal all wounds, 
satisfy our deepest longings, and fortify our faith like nothing else. I've always enjoyed, this is a memory verse for me, Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will comfort you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. This is the Father heart of God. He rejoices over us. He celebrates us. He loves us. He adores us. Oh, my goodness, that is out of this world. That's what he wants us to know. Here's the next one. He is not a bondage maker, but a bondage breaker. He's not a restrictor. He's a liberator. Look at verse uh, 4. I led them with cords of kindness. This is interesting language. Like I said, does God have uh, rules for us? Yeah, the Ten Commandments. Does he have maybe restrictions for our lives? Absolutely, but it's out of his perfect love, infinite wisdom, and he calls them cords of kindness with bands of love. I became to them as one who eases the yoke from their jaws. I bent down to them and fed them. So he's giving us a little bit of a different metaphor here. God is like a farmer who treats his heifer more like a pet than a working animal. It's kind of the idea here. But the idea here is that, listen, listen, God is not a restrictor. He's a liberator. The more you you pursue him, the more you get to know him, the more you follow him, the more you obey him, oh my goodness, he will bring freedom to your life unlike you've ever known. You try to do life on your own, that's restrictive. That brings bondage. That brings enslavement. We see it all around us. Look around in our culture today. But the more you're fully devoted to him, more you're, the more you're going to experience the fullness of life that only he can give you. I like Micah seven 18. I'll just tell you the last part of it. It just says that he delights in showing us steadfast love. Another one of my favorite memory verses, I'm sure you've heard this many times if you've hung out with us for any length of time, it's 1 John 3.1. This is a good one. The, the apostle of love who wrote this, uh, 1 John 3.1, he says this, how great is the love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of of God, and that is what we are. Now, what's interesting, he uses an idiomatic phrase here at the beginning. It's how great is the love, and idiomatic phrases uh, would be like it's raining cats and dogs. You try to translate that into Japanese or Chinese, it makes no sense to them whatsoever. And so they didn't know how to translate this from the Greek to the English language, so they just put great. But, But what he's saying is this is out of this world. This is beyond your wildest dreams. He's, he's trying, he, it's very emphatic. He says, how great is the love the Father has lavished. I like that word too because this is that time of the year when my wife makes those uh, cinnamon sweet rolls and she lavishes them with frosting. And I love it and chase it with a cup of coffee. I, I always, I'm always reminded of that. So he lavishes us with his love. How great is the love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. I mean, the reality of that. He's just saying, come on, man, get this down into your heart. This will change everything about you. This is more thrilling than anything you could think, dream, or imagine. This is more thrilling than anything you could acquire, achieve, or accomplish in life. You live in the reality of this. This will change everything. And and, and here's part of this idea. And, and, And so when you have your personal time with God, devotional time, whatever you want to call it, quiet time, you read his word, you pray, you talk to him. This is what you should be basking in, the reality of his love for you. And, and, and you should be thinking, as God's child, there is never a moment when you're not an object of his undivided attention, unconditional affection, an unlimited action working for your good and His glory. He loves all of us as if there's only one of us. 
And you're thinking, wow, that just kind of exploded my finite brain. Absolutely. Our brain's way too small to comprehend this infinite and eternal God that we can have an audience with Him every morning and walk with Him throughout every day. I'm telling you, this is beyond our wildest dreams. That's what He offers us through the shed blood of Jesus. Um, this, is, this is absolutely amazing. If you only knew the Father heart of God for you, it would change everything. Change everything about your life. You live in the reality of it. Oh my goodness, what we have in Him is absolutely amazing. So the Father's, that's the Father's loving heart. Now let's look at the Father's broken heart. He talks about this in verses 5 through 7. The cruel consequences of our refusal to return to God. Let me define for you sin. There's, uh, sin has multiple definitions, but I'll just give you one. We've been talking about really the definition of sin as being spiritual adultery or spiritual infidelity throughout this book. But I'll give you another one here. It's, uh, in, in understanding sin, we need to understand what fearing God is. The Bible talks a lot, a lot about us fearing God, not being afraid of God, but fearing God. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And fearing God is more than a general belief in God. It is being filled with a joyful awe and wonder of the beauty and the glory of who God is and what He's done for us that we we tremble at the privilege of knowing, serving, and obeying Him. That that would be the fear of God. And I, I mention the word tremble because when we get to the end of our text, verses 10 and 11, he uses that word twice, tremble, and he's talking about the fear of God, a healthy fear of God. You see, sin shrugs at God. No big deal. You're just cavalier, casual about your relationship with God. Sin shrugs at God. It's not just failing to believe that He exists, but that He matters more than anything in this world. If knowing God isn't your greatest passion, your greatest priority, your greatest pursuit, then you are out of touch with reality, and and that would be sin. You're missing the the best part of the Christian life. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What, what does that mean? We fail to see how desirable and satisfying He is. We're living way below that. He doesn't have our heart's deepest loyalties and affections. He's not our greatest passion. Therefore, we're not able to live for His glory. We're living for the glory of ourselves or for something else. So we fall short of that. And that has consequences. Here's the consequences for the people of Israel. These are the consequences for us too. Under bad leadership. That puts us under bad leadership. Look at verse 5. They shall not return to the land of Egypt. That's the southern enemy. But Assyria, that's the northern enemy, shall be their king. What? Their enemies. The enemy's king will lead them because they have refused to return to me. So under bad leadership. By the way, that's what's happened to our culture today. We have bad leadership. We need new leadership. That's why we need to get out and vote. We got a, a big election coming around in another year. We need to get busy. We need to change the leadership. I'm talking political here. He's talking political and spiritual. There's some incredible parallels here. Unprotected spiritually. Think also unprotected politically physically as a nation. Look at verse 6. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. Now listen to me. Israel's bad leadership led to open borders, weakened military, and unholy alliances of placating and patronizing the enemy, leading to their eventual demise. Sound familiar? That's where we're headed as a nation. We're next in line after Israel. These terrorist organizations and countries have us on the list next. And with open borders, we're already vulnerable. 
And I want you to know that the adversary is a terrorist. What happened to Israel, he wants to take you out spiritually. That's important for us to always keep in mind. That's why we want to continue to support Israel and all that they represent. We have people within our own country. I didn't mean to get political here, but I guess I, I, I think it's important for us to, to think about this. We've got people in our own country that support Hamas and Hezbollah. That's insanity. That's what's infiltrated our ranks, and that's why we need to be vigilant. But there's a lot of interesting political and also spiritual parallels here that we need to keep in mind. This is what's happening to, to Israel. The same thing, that's where we're headed as a people. Now, let me just say this. Let's switch from politics now to, to more of our spiritual battle. Your greatest defense against sin and suffering in this world is finding your deepest pleasure in God and feeling His deepest pleasure in you. This must captivate and capture your heart and imagination more than anything in this world. His love for me must captivate and capture my heart more than, than my wife's love for me or your love for me or my kids' love for me or my grandkids' love for me. This has got to be more powerful in my life than anything else. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to respond to them appropriately. And this leads to so under bad leadership, unprotected spiritually, unable to endure hard times. Look at verse 7. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. What? Wait a minute. I'm a believer. Yeah, but you just, you neglected coming to him and spending time with him and cultivating a relationship with him. You have no spiritual disciplines. You have no spiritual arsenal. You have no spiritual equity to get you through the hard times. That's what they're doing. This is why they call out to him, but they have no resources to draw upon. There's a major difference between trying versus training to do something, such as trying versus training to hike the Grand Canyon. If you've not really worked out much, and you all of a sudden get all your friends together and go, we're going to go hike the Grand Canyon, you better put the rescue helicopter on standby, okay? Because you're not going to survive. Now, if you've been working out, maybe, just maybe, you might be able to survive that. But you're not going to do it by trying. But you can do it by training. Maybe if you get off the couch and start walking some laps around in your neighborhood and then you, you develop a little bit more, more than just your neighborhood, maybe a few miles, maybe you go to Thunderbird Park and then begin to hike that mountain, maybe go to South Mountain, hike that a little bit, begin to put some miles on, and then maybe by training, when you're at the Grand Canyon, it's not going to kill you. Same thing is true when you face difficulties. If you haven't been training, if you haven't been practicing spiritual disciplines, you're going to be taken out. You have no spiritual equity, no spiritual arsenal to draw upon when you go through difficulties. That's where they are. They're crying out to God, God, where are you? He, was, he would be saying to them, where have you been? I've always been here. I've always wanted and longed for you to get close to me, but you stiff-armed me. You just shrugged at me. No big deal. And it's, it's really important for us to understand this. Training has to do with discipline. A discipline is any activity I can do by direct effort that will eventually enable me to do that which currently I cannot do by direct effort. The end of spiritual disciplines. By the way, spiritual disciplines, prayer, uh, Bible study, hanging out with other Christians in small groups, attending weekend services, is not an end in itself that you check off the kind of the box. It's a means to an end. This is what it is. It's a means to this end. It's to experience the wealth of his presence, the comfort of his love, the strength of his power, the significance of being called a child of God. You want that from your head down into your heart where it becomes an experience. And when that becomes more and real, more and more real to you, when it begins to captivate your heart and imagination more than anything else, and you cultivate this level of intimacy with God, not if, but when you face hard times, you'll not only be able to endure them, but become better 
and stronger and wiser and deeper and more intimate in your relationship with God through the hard times. The Father's loving heart, the Father's broken heart, now the Father's gracious heart. These verses, verses 8 and 9, are heartrending. God cannot bear the thought of abandoning the people he has loved and lived with, yet justice demanded that they be punished. Is one of the most deeply moving statements in the Bible, giving us a glimpse of God's deep affection for us. So here, here's my question for you. When you struggle with sin and suffering, when, when you're struggling with a hurt or a habit or a hang-up, whatever it might be, do you see God as cold and condemning or warm and welcoming? Do you have an appropriate concept of God when you're struggling in, in your sin and suffering? In our struggle with sin, God isn't just putting up with us or fed up with us. In fact, if, if I were to look into the New Testament for this Father heart of God for us, His deep affection for us, where would we find that? Well, it's vividly seen in the story of the man who had two sons found in Luke 15. Anybody know what that story is? Turn to the person next to you and see if they know what I'm talking about there. The man with the two sons. What is it called? The prodigal son or sons, both sons were prodigals. They were both lost. The word prodigal means extravagant. I think they actually would be best known as the prodigal father because the father is incredibly extravagant in his grace and love towards his son. The younger son, who would be classified in the category of being irreligious, basically gave the father the middle finger and said, I want my inheritance, and he went out and spent it on wild living, crazy, spent it all, found himself in the pig pen, came to his senses, came back to the father, and this is what it says, the reaction of the father uh, in verse 20 of Luke 15, while he was a long way off, the father saw him, was moved with compassion for him. There's that deep, deep affection for us. And he ran out to him, which is highly unusual for a patriarchal father to run. Children would run, women would run, men would not run. But he so adored his son, he ran out to him and embraced him. And literally it says he smothered him with affection, with kisses. This was a son that took his inheritance and blew it. How does God think about our reckless living and life? Man, he welcomes us with open arms if we'll come back to him. But what about the religious older brother who refused to come into the party? He was ticked. He was angry. He was bitter. How does the father respond to that? Well, it tells us in verse 28, he's the religious brother, that the father went out to him and tenderly pleaded with him. Here's what the story tells us. The father runs to us faster than we prodigal sons and daughters run to him. Listen, this morning... He's running to you. He's coming after you. He loves you. His deep affection for you is what awaits you if you'll turn to Him, if you'll come to Him. Whether you're irreligious or religious, turn towards Him. Give your life to Him. Surrender your life to Him. There is nothing you can do to make Him love you more, and there's nothing you have done to make Him love you less than what He loves you right now. I sit down with a number of people who are believers and also unbelievers, and they really struggle with this whole idea that you don't have to change for God to love you. He loves you so that you can change. Most people think, I got to get my act together. I got to change. I got to, man, I really messed up this week. I'm not even going to show up to church. Or, yeah, if I came to church, I hear this a lot. When I, if I came, I'm, I'm surprised the walls haven't come down on top of me, the roof hasn't come down on me. They're thinking God's judgment. No, no, no. 
Now let me say it again. You don't have to change for God to love you. He loves you so that you can change. I'm telling you, you get to know the Father heart of God for you. I'm telling you, that will change you unlike anything else. If you only knew the Father heart of God for you, it would change everything. In this text, verses 8 and 9, I want us to kind of walk through it here a bit slowly, but it gives us both... It gives us three characteristics, attributes of God, his justice, his mercy, and his grace. First one is his justice. Justice is getting what, what you deserve. Look at verse 8. How can I give you up? How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboam? These are two of the five cities destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. We've got then the mercy of God. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Second part of verse 8. My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. This is God. We're getting a look into the very heart of of God, his mind, his heart, his desire for us. NLT puts it this way, my heart is torn within me and my compassion overflows. If you've ever had a wayward, rebellious child, or if you've ever lost a child, that is the heart cry. My very first funeral that I did as a young pastor was for a stillborn, and the family was devastated. I've done many funerals for parents who've lost a child through disease, homicide, or suicide. I'm telling you, it's the parent's worst nightmare. Nancy and I have friends who used to attend Desert Breeze. They moved to Ahwatukee, and right now, their 38-year-old daughter is in hospice care dying of brain cancer. It is their worst nightmare. I met with a family this last week that lost their 24-year-old son to cancer, and I'm doing their funeral this next week, his funeral this next week. It is their worst nightmare. If you've ever had that experience before, you get a glimpse of the heart of God for us. This is the cry of God for his people. And I want you to know that if you've ever, if you have a wayward son or daughter, if you've ever lost a child, I, I just want you to know this, that the one who names and numbers the stars can heal your wounded heart and bind up your wounds. I've seen it time and time again. He's done it for me. He can do it for you. That's Psalm 146, 3 through 4. I mean, think about that. The one who names and numbers the stars. There are 200 billion trillion stars. The one who names and numbers every one of those stars can heal your wounded heart and bind up your wounds. Oh, my goodness. I've seen that time and time again. He will do that for you. He can do that for you. It's in his grace. Look at grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. This is what he provides for us. Look at verse 9. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, 
the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. I mean, we too easily think that God is angry, unforgiving, and vindictive like we are when we have been sinned against. But notice what he says here. I am God. I'm not like you. I'm not a man. Praise God. Proverbs 28, 13, this is a verse we looked at when we were talking about repentance a few weeks ago. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them, confesses and forsakes them, will receive mercy, will obtain mercy. Remember mercy, the definition there is a parent's deep affection for their newborn. God's a deep affection for you. When you stop hiding and you confess and forsake your sin, you turn to him, what awaits you? His deep affection for you. That's what awaits us, to heal our hearts. So how can God withhold justice to his son Israel and offer his mercy and grace instead? Because centuries later, his innocent only begotten son would suffer for the sins of the world. By the way, that's when we took communion this morning. That is what we were celebrating. In fact, look at this next statement. This is a gospel statement. This is what we were celebrating, and this is what we always celebrate when we take communion. In justice, God passed the required sentence of death on our sin. But in mercy, he took that punishment himself on the cross and in grace restores us to intimacy with him. The level of intimacy, I defined it here in John 15, 9, 17, verses 22 through 23. If you want to know where I get this idea of feeling his deepest pleasure for you, it's right there. Because Jesus talked about it in John 15, 9. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you with the same kind of love. Abide in my love. And then he goes on and he talks about this in his prayer to the Father in verses 22 and 23 of chapter 17. The same glory that he has given to me, weight, significance, importance, he gives to you. The same love he gives to me, he gives to you. The deep affection he has for me, that's what you can experience for you. I would encourage you to read those verses. They're powerful. So how does this fit in with what, in fact, happened? For Ephraim, Israel, the northern kingdom, fell in 722 B.C. and was exiled to Assyria. One answer could be that Israel was given after this prophecy yet another chance to repent. But I think there's another answer here, and it more probably the answer lies in the remnant, the remnant. Our country is going to hell in a handbasket, and we need to be that remnant that continues to fight like nobody's business and to win as many people as we can to the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to pray for revival. We need to be that remnant here in this country. Praise God. And there was a remnant that still lived for God in the midst of all of this, people that were faithful. They stayed faithful to God even in exile and whose descendants returned with them from Babylon to be part of the continuing Israel, which eventually meets us in the New Testament as the first century church following Christ. So the next paragraph seems to bear this out. In fact, the next uh, two verses bears this out. Here's the last one, the Father's redeeming heart. Look at verses 10 and 11. They shall go after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. So this would be for us also, not just the remnant in that that day and time. They shall go after the Lord, and he will roar like a lion. Uh, Roaring like a lion speaks of courage in the face of hostility and difficulty. It speaks of being a conqueror when our circumstances are, are horrible. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. Verse 11, they shall come trembling like birds from Egypt. There's the the idea of, of fear of God. And like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. Here's your last couple fill in the bank, fill in the blanks. We become more than conquerors when we come home to God. Better yet, when we make our home in God, we become more than conquerors. If the Father loves me, 
it doesn't matter who hates me. If he says that I belong to him, it doesn't matter who rejects me. If he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, it doesn't matter what happens to me. We become more than conquerors when we come home to God or make our home in God. Here's the next one. We follow his leadership while trembling at the privilege of knowing him. What an amazing privilege we have that we can have intimacy with the God of the galaxies. If you fear God, you will fear nothing or no one else. If you only knew the Father heart of God for you, it would change everything. If you only knew what he thinks about you, how he feels about you, what he wants to do in and through your life, nothing would keep you from him. Next weekend, Look back and learn how to get past your past. We're going to talk about that, Hosea chapter 11, verse 12, to chapter 12, verse 14. I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders and leaders. If you're new, we would love to meet you. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. If you've got any questions, we'd love to answer those questions for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. So, Father God, I pray first for those who don't know you this morning that this This weekend, they would make the most important decision of their life. They would acknowledge their sin that separates them from you, believe that Christ died in their place for their sins, and confess you as their Lord and Savior. Pray that they would do that even now, sometime this weekend, Lord. They'd give their life to you and live their lives for you. I pray for those who have a father wound that you would heal them, removing any false idea or concept they have of you. And I pray that we all would realize more than ever that you love all of us as if there is only one of us and that there is never a moment when we are not an object of your undivided attention, unconditional affection, and unlimited action working for our good in your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name. And everyone said... Amen. Love you guys.